This space, like being here downtown, it just matters, man. Like matter matters, right? Like being in the heart of the city, like on the mall, it just says, it's, in many ways it speaks so loudly that every inch of Kalamazoo belongs to God. Jesus is the one that says you, talking about the church, that we are a city set on a hill. And from Jesus' perspective, when he says the church is meant to be a city on a hill, what he's talking about is in context of the world that dwells in darkness and hopelessness spiritually is equated with darkness. When people are living in a dark world and they don't have hope and they don't know where to go, God wants the church to be this place of elevation he wants the church to be a light that shines, that gives hope to people. It says, come here. Come here, you're gonna find me. Come here, you're, you can find peace. Come here and you will find hope. Come here and you will find a purpose for your life. And you know, sometimes people work so hard to just kind of blend in, but Jesus said that's not what the church is supposed to be. You're not supposed to just blend in. You're supposed to stand out. Because when you stand out, people see what God is doing in you, and if they can see it in you, then they can believe that God can do it in them. When Jesus said that in Matthew 5, he said, look, you're, you're called to be salt, you're called to be light, you're called to be a city set on a hill. Like that context is, hey, you, you need to stand out. You're, you're supposed to bring uh, the presence of God and the goodness of God into other environments. If Jesus has called us to like to be the light of the world, we can't be afraid of the dark, right? You just can't, right? You have to go, you have to do something. And so for us, um, being a city on a hill practically means being visible to be seen, right? The Bible says like, let your, let your light so shine that what men may see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. And so when you see um, that star, I don't even know what we call it, splash. <laughs> but when you see the radiant logo, Walking like that should mean something. We want that to invoke something. So a city on a hill, like we want to be visible, we want to be seen, and, and people will see our good works, right? So it's not just being present. It's not just showing up, but it's the way in which we operate and the way in which we carry ourselves that people want to see that and glorify God. I think Radiant Church has always been a place where you can encounter the presence of God, and that is the thing that can change your life for eternity. So yeah, we have excellent worship and Pastor Lee's an incredible communicator and all of those are, in, are important facets to um, what we do and who we are. But at the end of the day, I believe Radiant Church is called to be a presence-driven church yeah. where you can sense and know and encounter the love of God. Yeah. To me, stepping forward in the Radiant City vision is it's not saying yes to growing the name of Radiant. It's not saying yes to growing an entity, you know, called Radiant Church. It's it's saying yes to the door of opportunity for the gospel to, to, to change and transform lives in a greater way, that it's reaching more people and more of those stories, uh, you know, are beginning to happen. And I have no doubt that that, that it will continue to happen, um, that these things, have, that, that we're moving forward and things we've prayed over. And if, look, if it's not transforming lives, if it's not producing fruit, then we don't want to do it. You know, we're not doing things just to, to make money or, or get popularity. Like, um, you know, we, we believe in the transformational power of the gospel and we want to steward the assignment and calling that God's given us. Well, I, uh, I had a really uh, difficult childhood, and uh, when I got out of school, I was just 17, and my dad died, and we'd had a really bad relationship. He was very distant and cold and gone a lot when he was home. He's a disciplinarian, so he died just before I turned 18, and 
at that point, kind of in the, the Bible talks about, you know, the, the Jews wandered in the wilderness. And so I, I ran to the wilderness and I just went to escape and, and got involved with that, all the cultural stuff in the late six, middle and late sixties and early seventies. And every day was a struggle just trying to blot out reality. And, and that lasted for almost 10 years. You know, when we talk about events that happen in our life that don't make sense. I mean, it, it didn't make sense. I mean, I met Eva and I just was stunned and I'd never, that had never experienced before. And I just, who is she? And unbeknownst to me, I found out later, you know, I don't even know if I found out before who we were married, but she said the same thing. Well, who is he? And so I don't think it was love at first sight. I think that I really believe that God can orchestrate events ahead of us that we walk into and that that was all part of my journey and her journey and it came together and uh, we did a lot of things the wrong way but it was certainly yeah i guess maybe whirlwind it wasn't too long and i just said you know we need to get married i think and we finally got married and uh, began this uh, this wonderful journey together i was 61, almost 62 years old before I stepped foot in Radiant Church. <laughs> and we went to church because my son had been going there and he'd had some difficulties. And uh, he asked us if we would go. And uh, Eva said, uh, my wife, his mother said, of course we'll go. And I went, well, I don't know, what kind of church is it? You know, they got loud music. And I walked in, I went, because I'd been to other churches off and on. I thought, what kind of church is this? That people are greeting you and saying hi and the music's going. I'm going, what is this? But once I heard um, Pastor Lee um, teaching, you know, I'd heard preachers, but I'd never really experienced in my mind I wasn't ready for someone to teach the Bible. And that's really what uh, really opened me up. Mike. Copenhagen, it's now Pastor Mike and Jackson, was the worship leader. And one day afterwards, they'd had their prayer team and he was standing there after church. And and I walked up and, and I told him, I said, you know, Mike, I've lived this life and, you know, I'm going to be 62. I said, is it too late? And he looked at me and had this beautiful smile and he said, Jim, it's never too late for the Lord to do great things in your life. And I just, and I walked away with real hope. The second thing was Pastor Lee was preaching and teaching and he was talking about that God will adopt you and you're going to be adopted into God's family. You're going to have a heavenly father and it was much more than that but he went on and on and all of a sudden you know I was crying and then he did the altar call and then my arm went up and I was crying. I just said I can't believe it you know that God wants me even though I think I was giving up on me as I got older, and I think other people give up on older sinners, you know, that, oh, he's so old and this and that, and he won't change it. And I think that's that's my view and the world's view, but it's not God's view. And uh, um, he wants us, and he wants us in his kingdom, no matter what we've done, if we'll accept him and his son as our savior. You know, the, the reality is, is that you know, we both kind of got saved at the same time, and that was wonderful. Um, but I can't kind of take back, and you can't, like that past. We can't. We want to close that door. But I still, I still remember that. And uh, and even though I can be kind of grumpy sometimes, you know, um, that I really don't want to be that guy. I mean, I love her, and and I owe her all these last years. Uh, not as a payment, but to just live as a godly man supposed to live for my wife. And uh, I want that. I want to be that man for her. It doesn't make up for the past, um, but it provides hope for today and for the future as we journey into into this, this next season of our life. Back in 1996, when we were, Jane and I were 24, 25 years old, we're dreaming about fulfilling this dream and this call that God has put on our heart of planting a church. And you know, when I was praying in those early days, I'll never forget, I was, 
I was in my little white Pontiac Grand Am. I was driving down 131 and I was praying. I was talking to God and I was praying out of my own concern and my own anxiety. And I just said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. And it was one of those moments where I know that God was imminent. He was there with me in the car. And he spoke to me and he said, Lee, if you'll build a praying and a worshiping church, then you'll impact the rest of the world. And we grabbed a hold of that. And that became one of the key pillars of what we built Radiant on from the very beginning was we're gonna be a, a people of prayer and we're gonna be a people of worship, a praying and a worshiping church. Every church by definition, I mean, it's one of the things that you do, right? It's every church by definition is a church that prays and a church that worships. There's a difference between that and being a praying church and being a worshiping church. And being a praying and a worshiping church together, uh, that that is a priority and it's an emphasis. It's not an add-on. It's like at the core of what you do. That has become, I believe, like this nuclear generator of the life of our, of our church. Long before we ever had buildings, long before we ever had hundreds and even thousands of people gathering, long before we had uh, a reputation or any of those kinds of things, there was this nuclear core of who we were, this deep conviction about prayer and worship, ministering to God, standing in the place of prayer, being worshipers, doing that together, and making that our priority, that has never changed. And I actually believe it's fueled the growth, it's fueled the value system, it's fueled the community, it's made us who we are today. I follow the Holy Spirit. I just know when he wants me to go out and pray and then I just I just wait for direction and go whichever way he wants. There's like three or four different routes I take. And I just ask the Holy Spirit, which way do you want me to go today? Some days I don't pray at all and I just smile at people and greet people and be kind and loving and caring. Um, every once in a while I'll end up praying with somebody. Some days there's a heavy burden to pray and some days there's just a a burden just to be out and be light. Well, we just started coming to Radiant two and a half years ago. Like the second time that we were at church at Radiant, Pastor Lee mentioned the prayer center, I just had one of those silent cries where the tears just poured out, just silent tears, and I just said, this is why I came to Radiant. I'm retired. My children are growing, my grandchildren are growing up. Um, and so now it's a season of life that I can spend my time just serving the, the Lord. And I found that the best way I can do it is through prayer. I've struggled with things in my life and it's like I finally found a place where I can feel safe and where I can feel free and where I can serve the Lord. and. Um, and no one can take it away from me, and no one can tell me I'm doing it wrong. And it's my safe spot, it's who I am. This is the heartbeat of Jesus, going out for the city and for Southwest Michigan. It's like going out, sending out from the heart of Kalamazoo. It's just sending out disciples, sending out people that are trained in worship and ministry, and sending out God's prayer, sending out worship. It's just a it's just a light. I can't believe I'm so blessed to be so close so that I can, I can just walk anytime and be here anytime. Radiant City Vision is what we feel called to do by God, I would say. So from a vision aspect, um, our mission statement is to lead people to make radiant disciples of Jesus Christ. So um, it's really about expanding and, and growing into that mission. We launched our Portage campus about three, three and a half years ago um, and just saw the growth of not just numeric growth, but growth of people, people that were coming to church, being in the presence of God. We really feel called to do that downtown. So a downtown campus, uh, something that we're calling the Radiant City Center now. Uh, some upgrades to Richland and Portage. Uh, so 
you know, making room, uh, specifically in Richland, uh, as well as some community upgrades to Portage, uh, potentially a playground and some other things, and then another campus in the Otsego Plainwall area were really the three kind of tangible parts uh, to Radiant City Vision. You know, when I look at um, the impact that we're trying to have, a lot of times as I've walked through um, life, there's been times with four businesses and kids that I've been like, oh man, I don't know, I kind of like to just muddle through a little bit or not press in so much. But God typically brings to mind about that time that I do that a stanza from a song that is one of my favorite songs, and that's Amazing Grace. And the stanza is, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. And what he brings me back to whenever he brings that up into my mind is, hey, this is temporal, this is a short span of time, and what we're talking about is eternity. When we've been there 10,000 years, we're gonna have no less days. And when we look at our time here that's temporal, we'll look, we look at 100 years and we think, wow, that's a long time. So, you know, who as a radiant tribe can we have an impact on and who is going to be there singing alongside us for those 10,000 years is, you know, in large part what drives me to go out and try to have the largest impact we possibly can. Now what Radiant City Vision does is it gives us some new vessels to do that in. Uh, the downtown corridor of Kalamazoo is exciting, it's different, it's challenging. Uh, it's not like suburban church. It's not Richland, it's not Portage, it's different. Um, the prayer room down there is the furnace, um, is exciting. The coffee shop uh, is another front door to Radiant that's different uh, for people um, as well. The schools being located, Radiant School of Ministry, Radiant School of Worship down there, young people and energy connection um, is is really exciting. And then Otsego Plainwell, uh, you know, just from a spirit-led and strategic standpoint, uh, we already have a church there. They just go to church in Richland. So just using that as a hub um, to once again advance the gospel, uh, to show the love of Jesus in, in a local community, much like we did in Portage. The Portage campus, our Radiant City Center, and future campuses, the goal is we can have that message be unified and come from one place through a, a channel and a medium of video, but everything else is about relationships, community, and knowing one another, growing in relationship with one another, growing in relationship to the Lord. So the idea of campuses is when we can go into a community and raise up a campus, we can reach more effectively people because we can engage people in their season of life much better. We don't have to have people drive 45 minutes to go to church. They can drive 10 minutes with their friends, develop more friendships and relationships. And so we're seeing that happen in Portage. You know, three plus years later, we're seeing the depth of relationship grow. And it's encouraging me to believe that we can see the impact of more campuses when they come. If we go into a different community, the ability to have impact there is much higher than having people leave their community and drive to a campus that's in another part of town. This space, like being here downtown, this is an answer prayer. And people even before Radiant, people who didn't even know Radiant was on the radar, have been praying for a space um, that prayer and worship, that God will receive that from downtown, um, that people will come to the Lord, be ministered to. And so the fact that we're here is like through the obedience and love and faith of the church, like, and not just Radiant, but the church um, at large. And so I think being here is a testament to God's goodness and His faithfulness and that every inch of this earth will be His. And I just think being here downtown is just a little glimpse of that, like spaces where people don't maybe don't want to see the church or the church hasn't been given that invitation, like we're no longer asking for permission for what's rightfully Jesus, right? Like what belongs to him. And so now we're here. And so I just hope that um, Radiant, this campus specifically would um, practically, I feel like um, the word that comes to mind is like an epicenter, right? A place where like action takes place, training takes place, and you're sent from that back to wherever you are. Thank you.
I grew up in South Africa in an amazing suburb called Clifton with the ocean, beautiful beaches. And my high school sweetheart, Taco, who I'm married to, we lived there when we first got married. And I had the opportunity to come to study in the States again. And he, you know, insisted, yes, you're going to do your doctorate. I had just had my second son. So you can imagine how I was feeling. Ocean versus PhD, babies versus studying, it just didn't gel. But in my heart of hearts, I knew God was saying, it's time. My mentality was, well, if I'm all in, that means going the whole way, right? That's full-time ministry. Well, his thoughts for me were, no, you're going to be a professor in Kalamazoo. It's like, what? I'm so glad I didn't know that initially because I probably would have hit and run a mile and pretended he never said that. But whether it's Timbuktu or Kalamazoo, you go where he wants you. The teacher in me would obviously want to bring the pure truth and the Word of God, but I'm blessed by the fact that I'm a business professor and I can teach on leadership and do and change management. So many of the principles that underlie most of those theories is biblical. So I definitely bring truth. I can bring what the Holy Spirit's saying without saying His name. Student lives are being changed because God loves those students and for many of them, they won't put foot in a church. And yet, I can bring His presence and even His words to them. And if God can talk through a donkey, He can talk through me, and He has. Kalamazoo being a university town, what does it draw? It draws people from multiple states throughout this nation. It draws people from around the world. So these students that you develop relationships with from all over the world, so they come in, you bond, and then they go home. And Radiant has an incredible opportunity and responsibility to spread the gospel that way by these people going back to their home nations and recreating much of what God's doing in this nation and in this city. Every time there's a major line in the sand moment where God's saying, okay, now I need you to do this. And I'm usually having a tantrum within myself. Not that God. I know it's in those moments, just healed. Just give it to him and trust that he knows what's best. And those are the moments where a miracle has been induced. Every time that I've yielded the pattern of that, he is, He's come through for me. And it's needed to be a miracle on so many levels. Because I, I am a wonder in the sense that there's no way that that beach bum could ever have become an academic. And, and he did it. We raised our children, they were homeschooled, um, they went to church. I can remember they'd go to youth group. I can remember my um, oldest daughter writing down all the notes from youth group. She'd write scripture and she had them taped on her um, door. So we never saw this day coming. Through circumstances, um, got into a bad relationship and started making a lot of really poor choices. We went through this situation where this young man was introduced to the family and well, our daughter liked him and uh, he, he just happened to be a drug addict and sold meth and distributed meth and took meth. And he got our daughter involved with that. I've learned you can never say, this would never happen to my child. You know, you, um, but they ultimately have their own decisions that they get to make. And I think the hardest was not knowing if she was safe, if she was alive, what was going on in her life. Um, 
Every single day though, I texted her. That was the one thing we let her keep was her phone and we paid for her phone service. We just wanted her to always know that she could come home when she was ready to. Ultimately, what happened is, is, is he um, blew up a meth lab. Uh, and she wasn't there at the time, but she had gotten pregnant. And you could just see that she was wanting to pull back, but she didn't know what to do or how to do it or anything. She had the baby. She came home with um, us for the first few days when she had her baby. And then dad came back into the picture and he took her and the baby. And then through different situations, he um, was arrested again. And so then she came and then I can remember sitting here and um, she wanted to take his calls. But we said, if you take his calls, CPS can take the baby away from you because you're mm -hmm. not supposed to have any contact. Yep. And it was kind of one of those defining moments yeah. of when she was ready to um, cut the ties and stay with us here at home. And from then she did, and then we were able to start rebuilding that relationship. After she had her baby, she had grown up in the church for a number of years. The people that welcomed her when she went, yeah. um, the people that brought her baby clothes and that sat and truly talked to her and loved her without her feeling judged, but just, just loved on her. The support we had when we were walking through the season, just the way people came alongside, really, truly, truly loved on us, supported us, prayed for us, prayed with us. Well, every time that family showed up, I, I equate it to God to know that this many people, I, God was showing me, you're not in this alone, but having people, every time they praying with us, I mean, uh, about the situation and giving us encouragement and hope and... And that was a, definitely a big impact on our life. And I don't know, I don't know where we would have been, where we would have gotten to if we didn't have those families that came alongside of us. When God sees our city, he sees it through the lens of its potential. You know, when Jesus went to the cross to die for the world, he did it before a single person cried out to him to be saved. He did it ahead of time. And that takes foresight. I, I believe when Hebrews says that Jesus was on the cross and he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him in the same way, we have to endure the hardship of, of doing the hard work and living like Jesus in our city because we have the ability to see through the lens of our city what it can be. You know, God desires that none should perish and that all should end up in heaven. So why can't we dream big dreams for our area? Why can't we dream that, hey, everybody in Southwest Michigan is gonna end up in heaven for eternity? Why can't that be our focus? Um, you know, God tells us in his word that he can do immeasurably more than we can ever think or imagine. Why can't we imagine these great big things and what we can do with this Radiant City vision to walk out and partner with him to have that type of impact? We exist to lead people to become radiant disciples of Jesus Christ. Radiant, I think, speaks to encountering and knowing the Lord. It, it literally changes and transforms who we are, a countenance from the inside out. And so there's a, a literal change in who you are because you know the Lord personally. And so we want to create environments for people to grow, not into being a convert, but into being a disciple. It's not just a Sunday thing. <laughs> like, it's not a weekend thing. My hope is that Jesus will be an everyday reality. As people wake up in the morning, they stop and say, God, what do you want from me today? Like, Holy Spirit, fill me today and give me joy to willfully follow you today, right? And then they do that the next day and the next day and the next day. Internally, I just have so much hope for what God is doing. And I look back at the last four years for me since being here, I cannot believe that we are here now. 
And all I can say is God is so faithful. He did so much more, abundantly more than I ever thought he would do. And and honestly, I just have this, who knows what, what could happen, but I am so excited for whatever the unknown is because he's proven himself and he's spoken so clearly. And so far, everything he's spoken so clearly has aligned so beautifully and so much more brilliantly than we could have orchestrated together that I just, I have that hope and expectation and excitement.
Jesus calls somebody, it's very simple. It's two words. I mean, we make it really complicated. Jesus uses two words, follow me. That's it. But to follow him means that where he's going, that's where I'm going. And so it's our responsibility as disciples of Jesus, then we have to ask ourselves the question, where's Jesus going? And I'll tell you where Jesus is going. Jesus is going to where the need is. And this whole thing, building a radiant city, is about us mobilizing to go to where the need is. Where the need is in our own city. And building practical, tangible tools, strategies, and resources that are gonna make it possible to reach the people that are on God's heart. There's nothing greater than I can think of if we really have an eternal perspective, then what are the things that we're doing in this life that really matter? I think from that eternal perspective, someday we're gonna look and go, everything I did was so worth it and I wish I had done more. So you ask me, what would I say? to somebody and why they need to be a part of this. Number one is because this is on God's heart. The city's on God's heart. Expansion and reaching the lost is on God's heart. If it's on God's heart, it needs to be on our heart. And number two, because there's nothing more worthwhile that you can invest your life, your time, your prayers, and your money into than building things that are gonna reach people and expand his kingdom here and around the world. And you might not be able to do it all by yourself, but your part is so important, it's so significant. If you don't do your part, then there's gonna be a part that is significant and is missing. But if we all do our part, collectively, we can do way more together than we think we can. We always have a tendency to underestimate what we can do and to overestimate what we can't do. And I just want you to know your life, your giving, your yes to Jesus can make a massive difference eternally, not just for our city, but for individuals, for people, for kids, for young people, for moms, for dads, for singles. You can change their life for eternity just by saying yes today.